So good morning, uh, lectures and participants. Uh, we are for, uh, formally starting uh, our uh, school, joint ISTP IAEA school and on nuclear data measurements for science and applications. The school will uh, uh, continue two weeks. So part of the lectures are here, and as the second part of the lectures uh, of the lecturers uh, will come uh, next week. So this is a web event of the uh, web address of this event, and uh, organizer includes uh, two persons from the International Atomic Energy Agency. So my I'm. <coughs> And uh, Danis Ridikas, uh, I will be here this week. Danis will come for the next week. And uh, local organizer, uh, Professor Johnny Miller and uh, <coughs> Lisa Aniti, who just uh, uh, talk to you about administrative details. Um, maybe it is a good, um, it, it will be good practice for the lecturers if they will say a few words about themselves. So, as concerning me, I worked the uh, last five years in the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. I am head of the Nuclear Data Service Unit. It means that our main task is distribution of nuclear data uh, among uh, member states of agency. It is uh, uh, more than 160 countries. Uh, before that, I worked um, 10 years in Fusion Center in Karlsruhe, where I was involved in the <coughs> nuclear data and uh, neutronic simulation for the fusion applications. Before that, I worked uh, um, rather many years in the Institute of Physical and Power Engineering in Obnis, together with uh, v uh, Vitaly Krichkov and his uh, students. I was involved in the uh, measurements, analysis of different type of uh, neutron and proton induced reactions, uh, uh, transport, and so on. So, um, I would like to say about the aim of this school and prehistory. So, this uh, lecture aims to introduce and deliver uh, concise and the most recent information on nuclear data in general and uh, specifically on the measurements, so which are required for fundamental research and various applications. So uh, before this event, there was some prehistory. So in 2012, sorry, sorry for mistake, yeah. <laughs> I noticed now it's uh, rather far future. Okay. So um, so, uh, nuclear, uh, agency, uh, nuclear Energy Agency organized a technical meeting on the use of neutron beams for higher precision nuclear data measurements. Proceedings are available as, uh, as a report. If you click on this uh, uh, link, then you will <coughs> get uh, this report with uh, additional information which uh, uh, in, in principle available as a CD-ROM, but uh, they are included uh, in this link. And one of the conclusion or recommendation of this meeting was organization of periodical technical meetings, education and training workshops or schools uh, to ensure knowledge transfer and uh, preservation. So in such a way, uh, the present school is somehow implementation of the recommendation of this meeting. So now I would like to say a few words about the content uh, of the school. It means that which type of data and which type of application will be covered by the uh, lectures. So this is a, a basic nuclear physics and nuclear data. So it's uh, like uh, we see a list of the <coughs> main uh, reactions which uh, neutrons uh, undergo <coughs> during it, its uh, collision with uh, uh, matters, with materials. 
uh, and last uh, uh, lecture will be properties of neutrino. It's some kind maybe outside, but it's also interesting to uh, wide our knowledge, and especially that uh, this year the Nobel Prize was awarded for the uh, <coughs> determination of, uh, of, the of the neutrino mass, if I remember correctly. So, and also besides a uh, cross-section of the basic nuclear data, there will be uh, several uh, lectures or exercises which will be devoted to the nuclear data for application. It will be included prompt gamma activation analysis and non-energy application of research reactors. So this is the last topic. It will be, uh, Danis Redikus will present this. Maybe... Uh, uh, additional information which will, be which will be scattered in the uh, lectures. So uh, it is important for the nuclear data to know uh, uh, about facility instrumentation, data analysis. So in these lectures and exercises, they will be covered uh, uh, various neutron source, sources and facilities, both uh, accelerator-based and uh, reactor-based. Uh, research reactor. So it is a uh, very famous and top facility, Lance in Los Alamos, uh, Linux Center, uh, <coughs> Rancella, and other facilities in the United States, Jelina in Belgium, facility in Japan, in Hungary, Grenoble, new facility, um, Neutrons for Science in Ganil, which is uh, under construction now. So, uh, li Linux neutron source in Bariloche, uh, Argentina, Van de Graaff's uh, neutron sources in Obnusk, and others. And as concerning instrumentation, naturally several speakers will speak about time of flight, standard time of flight, or uh, lead down, slowing down spectrometers. There will be lectures about uh, detectors for neutrons, fission chambers, uh, 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 digital charge particles, spectrometry in gaseous or fission uh, detectors, Brakov counter for charge particles, and others. So uh, another essential point of learning is uh, real practical exercises, how uh, data taken in experiment, how the pre preliminary process and analyzed. So it will, will be a topic of... Uh, uh, several exercises which will include uh, modern energetic neutron source properties, uh, neutron flux measurements, air matrix analysis of cross-section and uncertainty propagation, and also essential part for all who are doing researches is uh, working with uh, uh, data already accumulated. It means X4 as a database of the all um, measured um, experimental uh, all measured cross-section, not only cross-section, seek target yields and many other quantities, and evaluated data cross-section, which we usually uh, design as evaluated neutron data files. So here is important data search, retrieving, plotting, intercomparison, and so on. There will be a sp special two uh, exercises devoted uh, to this topic, so another member uh, from nuclear data section, Victor Zerkin, he will come here and make such exercises. Uh, about how this um, event was organized, so main organizer, a co-sponsor, it was uh, this uh, ISTP um, center. Then nuclear data section and physics sections of International Atomic Energy Agency. Then uh, we uh, collaborated rather tightly with the um, Neutron Time Flight Facility in CERN. They recommended uh, uh, lecture, lecturers. And uh, uh, as a co-sponsor is the uh, uh, University in Sevilla, which is, uh, has uh, such a project like uh, uh, European project for neutron size and Europe. And Europe and Spain. Uh, so the total school will comprise comprises uh, 25 lectures and eight practical exercises. So there will be additional uh, poster session. I'm not sure one or two, with uh, voting of uh, uh, prizes and uh, certificates to the three best uh, posters. 
So I would like to send, uh, thank for contribution to the ISTP staff, especially to the school secretary, Lisa Yaniti. You uh, contact with her, very, uh, I guess, on many occasions. Also, housing and uh, visa and uh, IT offices of uh, ISTP. Then, as I would like to thank in advance the lectures for coming and for the transfer of knowledge in the form of the lecturing, tutoring, uh, direct communication with the students. And uh, to the students, I wish uh, or we wish to learn intensively the subject of the school, be active during school, and establish partnership with the leading expert and labs. So this is uh, what I would like to say. If there will be a window, I can make a presentation, technical presentation about uh, what nuclear data section, uh, how it develops nuclear data, and how it distributes nuclear, nuclear data. So thanks for uh, attention. If no question for such a formal introduction. So then next lectures. Everybody, good morning. Sorry? Sure. Yeah, I know, I know. So, first of all, while I'm switching on the other computer, I would like to thank the organizers for the uh, invitation. Uh, my name is Nicola Colonna. I'm from uh, INFN, uh, National Institute of Nuclear Physics in Bari. Uh, I, I'm in, since the beginning, uh, I'm involved in the top. Just uh, one more, few more seconds for the preparation. Um, okay, should start now. Perfect. So, uh, as I said, I'm uh, involved in the end of collaboration since the beginning, and uh, I, mm, before that, I used to work in uh, uh, fundamental nuclear physics and uh, neutron induced, uh, sorry, yeah, neutron induced reactions, uh, heavy ion induced reactions, and uh, uh, nuclear medicine. So right now I'm mostly concentrating in the end of uh, project, and I will uh, uh, discuss a little bit um, about the uh, uh, activity uh, going on on fission, but before I will give an introduction. In fact, uh, um, I will uh, describe uh, the motivation for measuring fission a neutron induced fission cross section. Uh, a few uh, words about the neutron beams that can be used, a little more in detail about NTOF, the NTOF facility. Uh, just a few words about the experimental method, and uh, if there is time, a few examples of measurements that we've done at NTOF which have uh, led to improvements in uh, uh, the current knowledge of uh, uh, neutron induced fission. And then, of course, a few conclusions. So uh, I will not go into detail for uh, those of you that are not very familiar with uh, fission, uh, just a few words about uh, uh, the, the process. Essentially, this is, the process is governed by uh, um, a barrier. Uh, and uh, uh, so when you have a, a neutron that is captured uh, by uh, a heavy nucleus, for example, a uranium isotope, uh, it produces a compound nucleus with an excitation energy that is given by the uh, neutron binding energy, neutron separation energy, plus the available um, kinetic energy in the center of mass. Then when, you, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, neutron separation energy is higher than the barrier, uh, fission can occur at any energy and, and at any neutron energy and this, for this reason this is called uh, this is referred to as a fissile isotope. Otherwise um, you have a threshold uh, minimum energy, minimum neutron energy, typically around 1 MeV uh, above which fission uh, can occur. This is often referred to as a fertile isotope. Now important uh, observables uh, when studying fissions are of course the differential uh, energy differential 
cross sections, the fission fragment mass distribution, the fission neutron multiplicity and spectra, the total energy released, and also the delayed neutrons. Now, just to give you a visual example of what I just said, look at uranium-235. Um, uh, this is the uh, uh, fission cross-section of uranium-235, and uh, the uh, neutron binding energy is 6.5 MeV. The barriers, the two barriers that you saw before, are uh, around 5 MeV. So essentially, uh, the energy uh, available is always higher than the barrier, and the, new, the fission occurs at any energy. If you look at uh, uranium-238, instead, the neutron separation energy is much lower, it's 4.8 MeV. So uh, in, and the barrier, it's much lower than the barrier, of course, which is 6 MeV. So uh, the real, uh, the, the fission occurs above, let's say, 1 MeV. But of course, you can have some uh, sub-threshold uh, uh, fission with uh, resonances that can provide important information also on the structure of the nucleus. Now, um, why is it important uh, to study, to measure fission? Of course, because you need to uh, get data for applications or also for uh, fundamental studies, but also uh, you, you, um, uh, to um, mostly uh, um, to implement and to improve models of uh, fission so you can predict fission cross-section, for, uh, for example, um, of isotopes that you cannot me directly measure. Uh, so let's see now the motivations in terms of uh, technology application. So what happens, uh, um, mostly these are related to the, to the working of uh, nuclear reactors. So what happens in a nuclear reactor? So you start from, as you probably uh, all know, you start from uh, uh, uranium-235, you capture a neutron, then the, from the uranium-236 compound nucleus, and this is, and this uh, fissions. Um, it produces uh, mm, uh, long-lived fission products or other fission products, uh, which uh, often um, are, are uh, let's say, have to be somehow uh, disposed. Uh, you can also mm, produce uh, Neptunium-237 because you capture uh, uranium-237 decays uh, quite quickly, produces Neptunium-237, which is a long-lived uh, uh, isotope. And this is, again, uh, part of the uh, nuclear waste. Uh, then more nasty things um, are produced starting from uranium-238, a series of uh, uh, neutron capture and the beta decays uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, actinides. In fact, um, uh, essentially plutonium-239, which is also used in, uh, as a fuel in uh, nuclear reactors, but you produce also uh, uh, americium isotopes and curium isotopes. And all these are uh, the, the typically long-lived uh, isotopes, which, uh, of course, you, uh, so you have somehow to uh, isolate from the environment. Um, another possibility, which, has, which is now uh, being considered, is the use of the so-called thorium-uranium fuel cycle. How does this work? Essentially, in this case, the fertile element, is uh, fertile isotopes, is the thorium-232. Um, uh, thorium-232 captures a neutron, then uh, uh, beta decays produces uranium-233. So the fissile uh, isotope, which, is used, uh, which could be used in reactors, is the uranium-233. Um, uh, but uh, you can also produce, again, as a, uh, a result of uh, successive neutron captures, you can produce a little bit of neutron 37. But the in interesting feature of this uh, fuel cycle is that you don't produce any of these AV um, uh, minor actinides that uh, you have seen before. So this is very interesting uh, cycle, and this is, being, this is why one of the reasons why it's being considered as a uh, possible uh, fuel for the f future reactors. Now, uh, in the, no, the, the, if you look at the nuclear waste, you have some uh, uh, fission fragments that I mentioned before, but they typically have lifetimes of the order of a few hundred years. So after, let's say, uh, 1,000 years, uh, the, the, uh, the radiotoxicity, that is the, the, the let's say, the uh, radioactivity uh, produced by these uh, by these active uh, by these fission fragments, has essentially decayed to the uh, natural level. 
Uh, on the contrary, if you look at the transuranium actinides, neptunium, uh, plutonium, americium, and curium, uh, uh, in particular, did you see that the radioactivity, the, the, uh, the, the radiotoxicity, the danger, dangerous uh, feature of this uh, waste um, decays much uh, slower and uh, it stays on for th uh, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. So although this uh, only represents 1.5 percent in mass, uh, of the nuclear waste, uh, they essentially provide the biggest radiotoxicity contribution uh, after 100 years. And uh, most importantly, the problem persists for, uh, like I said, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, on top of that, some of these isotopes are also fissionable, which means that uh, they pose problems of criticality and uh, proliferation issues. Okay, so uh, at present, the only problem, the only way thing you can manage is uh, the, these, uh, this waste is to put them in a geological repositories. Um, but if you do that, uh, of course, it, this is, uh, for example, a calculation. You would need, uh, you, you see, if you have uh, current reactors, they are called once through because the fuel goes only once through the reactor and then it has to be uh, disposed, uh, then the amount of uh, waste increases. And just to give you an idea, this is the capacity of one of the uh, geological repositories that have been considered in the US. Uh, now it, it, I think it's uh, stopped. But in any case, you will see that uh, at the current rate of use of nuclear energy, you would need an, a, a, a geological repository like Yucca Mountain every 20 years. And we still don't have one. So this is really a, a major problem of nuclear energy, the fact that you uh, need to find the, geological depositories for uh, long-lived um, uh, waste, essentially actinides. So uh, another possibility, as I mentioned before, this is the uh, problem related to the, the current uh, technology, which is uh, uh, called once through. The fuel is prepared, goes through the uh, core, the reactor core, and then eventually has to be disposed once it is spent, what it is not, it cannot be used anymore. Um, uh, of course, this is, uh, there are other problems, apart from the radioactive waste, there is also the fact that you don't use very efficiently uh, the, the, uh, the fuel, and pretty soon this is also going to be uh, um, uh, as to uh, can, can the, the cannot be available anymore. So uh, another possibility is to um, recycle at least part of the uh, waste, in particular uh, the fission, the, the, the actinides. And in this case, you first of all use more efficiently the, the uranium resources. And secondly, uh, the amount of waste that needs to be disposed of in uh, um, uh, geological repositories is much smaller. So uh, clearly you need a new generation uh, reactor to do this. And uh, uh, these are the so-called four um, generation four reactors, mostly fast reactors, we will see. Uh, there are also other uh, possibilities to use the so-called accelerator-driven system. Uh, I will be a more, little more, more specific in a minute. Uh, of course, uh, the main advantage will, will be the higher efficiency, lower production of waste, but uh, uh, of course one aims also to improve the safety uh, and the non-proliferation uh, aspects, and uh, possibly also to lower the costs and construction time. Uh, now, uh, probably many of you are already aware that there is a, a large activity going on, an international uh, collaboration also, in uh, uh, an international effort, I would say, in uh, towards uh, generation for uh, uh, reactors. And there are several types. I will not go into the details of the, uh, uh, the say, the technicalities of the reactors, uh, and we'll just mention that most of them are fast reactors. Why, uh, uh, okay, so before I go to uh, that, uh, the, as I mentioned before, there is another possibility that has been considered for some time uh, uh, for um, burning uh, nuclear waste and transmutating nuclear waste, and this is the so-called accelerator-driven system. 
So how, how, how does it work? Essentially, we have an accelerator, proton mostly, high current, high energy accelerator uh, of the order of, let's say, GeV. Then uh, the proton beam is injected in a, um, uh, on a spallation target, which is uh, typically lead or some heavy material that we will see uh, in a minute also. Uh, this is, of course, surrounded by a, a, a subcritical core. Um, so you produce, in this case, in this uh, spallation target, the neutrons uh, that are just enough to sustain the reaction. And then, of course, this uh, uh, produce uh, energy. Uh, the energy goes to produce electricity. Part of this electricity, of course, has to be uh, uh, supplied to the accelerator to make it work, and part of that can go to the grid. But in, the important thing is that uh, in this core, you can put fission fragments and minor actinides, and uh, it, the reactions that will occur here will uh, transmute them. That is, will uh, essentially transform them in, uh, from long-lived to short-lived uh, um, uh, radioactive isotopes. So, um, of course, this is intrinsically safe because if you turn off the accelerator, you don't have any more reaction going on. You don't essentially you turn off the uh, reactor here, um, uh, the chain reactor. Um, you <coughs> can incinerate nuclear waste, but you can also use also the different fuel cycles, cycles like the thorium uranium that I was mentioning before. Okay, uh, of course, uh, what are the, uh, in order to, to make such a um, device, such a reactor, subcritical reactor with an accelerator, you need uh, to develop uh, this kind of accelerator, which has to be high current, high stability, and also you need to uh, somehow um, get, uh, let's say, design the core, and for this you need, since you are putting in the core of the reactor fission fragments and minor actinides, you need to know the cross-sections of these isotopes in order to calculate the behavior of the reactor itself. So um, let's look a little bit at the physics of, the, uh, of these um, uh, new reactors. Essentially, as I mentioned before, the main uh, innovation uh, concerns the possibility to use and at the same time burn uh, minor actinides like neptunium, americium, and curium, which right now uh, you cannot, uh, you have to just uh, uh, put somewhere for hundreds of th and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Now, if you look at the cross section of uh, some isotopes of these elements, uh, uh, well, you know that uh, you, like uranium-235 and plutonium, they are fissile materials, so the cross-section uh, essentially is quite large at all neutron energies. This is the neutron energy scale here, but many of these actinides uh, are uh, a threshold, uh, they, 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 they fission above a certain threshold, typically 1 MeV. So clearly you cannot induce, uh, you cannot induce uh, fission unless you have a neutron flux in this energy region. And uh, this is uh, the, the spectrum that you see here. It is, uh, is what uh, typically it should be for a generation four or an ADS uh, reactor. So it's, uh, it's, it's typically a, a fast neutron spectrum. Uh, in current reactors, the so-called thermal reactors, the neutron energy is uh, much lower, it's a thermal energy. Here you have uh, a neutron energy which is centered at a, hundred, at a few hundreds uh, kV and, and with a tail that extends to several MeV. So you can burn also, you can induce fission also on threshold uh, um, uh, isotopes. Now, um, Okay, so they require uh, energy of above, uh, neutron energy is above 1 MeV. And of course, if you want to design such a system, you need data uh, with the high accuracy in that region. So for the design of new generation reactors, and the uh, generation 4 or ADS, uh, you need, uh, and, and also for safety parameters, you need uh, accurate data on fission and capture and other uh, quantities. Uh, um, uh, fission capture cross-section and other quantities that regard these minor actinides. So um, 
data on minor actinides are essentially fundamental. Just before uh, going on, uh, I think everybody knows uh, in this room what is the difference between eye accuracy and eye precision. But just in case there is somebody that uh, doesn't remember the difference, uh, I, I will show it just with uh, a plot. That, I mean, this is a target and a phrase uh, that says it is better to be roughly right, which is uh, close more or less to what the real value than precisely wrong. So the difference between accuracy and precision is that accuracy mm, measurement with high accuracy means a measurement that gives you a data which is close to reality. Precision it may give you a, a, always very good data but not uh, with systematic which is systematically off from reality. The, by the way this phrase apparently comes from uh, um, Keynes so um, it is fundamental when you measure any kind of uh, cross-section, um, when you make any kind of measurement, to have a good control of the systematic errors. And we will see that in fission cross-section measurements, this is one of the most important, uh, let's say, and most difficult tasks. OK, so um, just to summarize what I just said, we need new accurate data for uranium, plutonium, minor actinides, and all this is needed for increasing uh, the fuel burn-up even of current uh, nuclear reactors, uh, but also for uh, future reactors. Um, of course, to use uh, the plutonium uh, that is being accumulated, for example, or also for uh, the plutonium that is around from, uh, let's say, nuclear weapons. Uh, for, for we need uh, data for the recycling of nuclear fuel in the closed cycle generation for reactors or for transmutation of the nuclear waste. Now, uh, there, you can find a long list of needs, of data needed, in uh, um, a compilation, uh, for example, th there are several, but one of the most important is the NEA, Nuclear Energy Agency High Priority Request List, where they uh, essentially keep up, um, uh, a list and they update uh, um, very often a list of requests uh, uh, that are important for uh, new generation, uh, for, for, let's say, nuclear technology. Um, uh, by the way, uh, you will. I saw that there is a session uh, later on in this uh, school. Uh, you will learn how to uh, retrieve data, uh, experimental data, but also evaluated nuclear data. I will just mention here that there are several libraries that contain data uh, um, of uh, evaluated nuclear. Uh, Evaluated cross sections, for example. Uh, this is ENDF, the, now it's the version 7.1. ENDF is the um, evaluated nuclear data file, uh, nuclear data file from the typically US. Uh, GENDOL is the uh, Japanese ev evaluated nuclear data library. JEF is the European one. Uh, BRONDEL is the Russian one. And there are also the Chinese and so on. So there are several libraries. And uh, uh, hopefully, um, they, sh they should contain data which are consistent to each other. But uh, in many cases, this is not so. The data, some of them are incomplete, or they show differences. They are discrepant between each other. And this is, of, of course, because often uh, there are not many experimental data available. So the evaluations are made based on uh, experimental data. And if they are not available, of course, the evaluations cannot do. Uh, they, they try to do the best with models. But of course, uh, the, uh, sometimes they cannot provide very accurate ev uh, evaluations. Uh, so in many cases, these are clearly inadequate for the requests related to advanced nuclear technology. Uh, and uh, of course, evaluators are always asking for new data so they can improve their uh, uh, evaluations. And not only for long lived, but also for uh, short of lives. Um, uh, year short means uh, tens or hundreds of years, of course. Now, uh, just to give you an example, uh, this, uh, this is a table for some specific isotopes and some specific reactions. Uh, what is, in, in a particular neutron energy ranges that you see here, what is the current uh, accuracy, which is uh, 
let's say, estimated on the basis of uh, available data. And this is what would be the required accuracy for the design of new generation reactors. So you see that, for example, uh, look at plutonium-242 fission. Uh, right now it's of the order of 20%. It should go down to 3%. So it's a huge effort that you need to uh, uh, make to, to um, uh, do in order to uh, re decrease the uncertainty in these cross-sections. Um, uh, by the way, in, I'm putting many slides some references where you can find uh, additional information, so you can find uh, uh, more details on uh, uh, the tables or the uh, plots that I'm showing. <laughs> now, uh, I will go very quickly. In Europe, for example, there is a, a big effort which is uh, financed by the European Commission in order to uh, um, uh, essentially uh, stimulate new uh, experimental activity, not only experimental, but experimental and theoretical activity uh, aimed at improving the current knowledge of uh, fission, uh, neutron-induced fission, neutron capture, or other reactions that are important for uh, the development of new generation reactors. In essentially, there is a, a, lot, a long list of uh, uh, reactions that need to be measured. And just to summarize, for the fission, you need to measure fission cross-section of actinides all the way from thorium to curium with a half-life from a few uh, years on. So essentially, this is a big um, this is a big problem because in uh, look at some cases, some experimental changes uh, challenges. Look at uh, plutonium 241. This is uh, only a, a lifetime of 14 years, uh, but still. Uh, the uncertainty right now is of the order of 10, 20 percent. That should go down to two to six percent in the neutron energy range between uh, 500 electron volts and 2 MeV. So it's a huge, uh, a wide energy range where you need new data. And the same thing for a medium 241, medium 242 metastable, curium 244, curium 245. So uh, these are not so easy to measure, essentially because of the short of life, which means that they have they are alpha emitters. Uh, it's a huge background in the detectors, as we will see uh, later, and it's not so easy uh, uh, to have a high accuracy. But nevertheless, there is this strong need. Uh, and uh, uh, this requires improvements in the experimental methods, in new facilities, neutron facilities where uh, uh, these measurements can be made. And in some cases, it will never be possible to measure directly neutron-induced fission on these isotopes. So another possibility is to use surrogate, so-called surrogate methods, uh, a technique that allows to uh, measure, uh, let's say, indirectly the fission cross-section. And we'll, as if there is time, I will give a, a few words on that. So now, let's go to the neutron sources. Um, so you have uh, several, of course, types of neutron sources. Le uh, the uh, most common one, the most, uh, let's say, famous ones are the low energy neutron beams for, from nuclear reactors. This is typically a neutron spectrum, a thermal neutron spectrum, uh, around 25 milli electron volts. Uh, and uh, um, this, is, uh, this can provide very useful, extremely useful data of thermal energy. Uh, you can also produce low energy neutrons from accelerator. Of course, originally you can produce neutrons of uh, a few MeV, a few hundred keV, but then you moderate them and then you uh, can also produce low energy neutrons. Then there is a whole bunch of uh, uh, accelerators around the world that can produce monoenergetic neutrons. Now, to do that, uh, you um, essentially use protons or neutron-induced reactions on a thin uh, sample, a thin target, let's say. Uh, typical reactions used are DD, TP, DT, and, but very commonly used also for uh, other purposes are the lithium PN. Uh, reaction and uh, beryllium PN reaction. So you produce neutrons at a given energy or with a given spectrum, let's say. Uh, these, are, these require only low and medium energy accelerator, a few MeV, let's say. Uh, you can change the energy of the neutron energy by changing the energy of the 
pri primary beam, primary charge beam, uh, and you can go in many cases up to 20 MeV. Uh, then there is another uh, set of uh, date, uh, set of uh, faci neutron facilities, the so-called time of flight facilities, in which you produce uh, neutrons with a wide energy spectrum, and then from the time of flight you try to reconstruct the energy of the neutron. So you can study the uh, cross section, for example, as a function of the neutron energy, which you determine from the time of flight. Uh, of course, uh, th there is always a trade-off in these kind of facilities between the um, flux that you can get and the resolution of your neutron energy, uh, because to get a higher resolution, you can go farther away from the source, but you lose flux in this case, and vice versa. And most in, uh, in, in these cases, of course, you require pulse accelerators. So typically, they are uh, lower; um, they, they produce lower neutron flux anyway. Now, uh, again, th you can have a time of different kinds of uh, time of flight facilities. You can, uh, like I said before, you can use uh, PN or DN reactions with the um, low or medium energy accelerator pulse, of course. You can use a thick target to produce a wide neutron spectrum and also a higher flux. And then you can, of course, put some moderation in order to get, uh, uh, to get uh, uh, energies down to thermal, uh, to thermal region. Um, you can also produce uh, um, uh, another very uh, famous, uh, let's say, other famous uh, time of flight facilities are based on electron beams. Uh, typically, in this case, you produce uh, neutrons through the gamma N reactions. Uh, first, you have, of course, to produce the um, gamma rays through in a uh, target with IZ material, for example, uranium, uh, from the electron beam, of course, and you can put also some moderation spectrum. So the most famous uh, facility of this kind is uh, Galena that you will hear in the next few days here. I will not spend much time on this, but uh, there used to be also Orela in, uh, in the United States. But, uh, okay, right now the uh, most productive one is uh, Galena. And then there is uh, the spallation neutron source. So spallation neutron sources are based on high energy protons, let's say of the order of GEVs. Uh, which impinge uh, on uh, large blocks of heavy material. And then, of course, you need also some moderation to uh, uh, increase the, um, the, 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 the spectrum, the neutron spectrum. Um, the, the, so, uh, spallation neutron sources, the most famous ones are uh, Lansk in the US, and TOF, J Park in, the, in Japan, and GNES in uh, Russia. Now, uh, Spallation is, uh, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the term, spallation is a series of uh, um, uh, reactions that occur uh, uh, following, let's say, the uh, high energy proton impinging on the, uh, on the material. So you have intranuclear cascade in which uh, essentially uh, nucleons are uh, at each other, and then you, at, at the end you can produce some uh, nuclei with some excitation energy that evaporate. You can have some pre-equilibrium emission also. Of course, uh, for these reactions to be effective, you need, uh, first of all, the high energy proton beam, but also you need large volume spallation target. By the way, if some of you are interested in uh, spallation, which is very interesting um, uh, process, uh, I would suggest this article, article from Goldenbaum. Uh, you can find it on the internet, I think. Now, um, the neutron in, in the spallation uh, neutron sources, the neutron production depends uh, essentially on two, of course, on the proton energy and uh, on the uh, atomic charge and uh, uh, density of the spallation target. Of course, there are also other, uh, uh, as usual, there are other uh, considerations that enter in the choice of the spallation target, like, of course, the radiation resistance, the cost, and so on. Now, uh, just a few words on the 
eh, Los Alamos uh, facility, the LANSC, uh, the Los Alamos Neutron Center, Science Center. This is essentially based on uh, 800 MeV proton on tungsten targets. There are mm, mm, few targets. Uh, it's, if you send the proton beam on a target without any moderator, you produce neutrons uh, all the way up to, let's say, 200 MeV. If you put moderator, then you uh, populate the low energy neutron uh, reg uh, low energy region um, up down to, of course, thermal energy. So uh, in, you can use two different um, targets depending, spallation targets, depending on what kind of neutron spectrum you, uh, you like. And you can, of course, this is important because in this center they made a lot of uh, studies, not only related to, uh, let's say, nuclear technology, but also material science and so on for other uh, um, aerosols, nuclear astrophysics, uh, for m many applications. Okay. Now, uh, interesting enough, so um, as I mentioned before, this is the neutron spectrum with the moderator. Um, Another interesting thing that they do is, uh, in order to increase the neutron flux, uh, they um, use a proton storage, storage ring in which they accumulate several bunches of protons uh, before they send them under the spallation target. And so you see that, uh, for example, uh, uh, if, they, if, if you uh, have 20 micro, uh, microamps pulse stacking, you have the highest neutron production, of course. So this is uh, uh, interesting, um, uh, allows to go essentially to cover a wide energy range, although not at the same time, from, let's say, thermal to almost, uh, uh, to, to essentially a few hundred um, MeV. Uh, another, uh, the, let's say this is a device, but it can also be considered, say, a facility. Uh, it, there are some measurements that are very difficult to be performed because they require very intense flux, uh, which is not uh, otherwise available. So the, uh, another in the, the, the technique is to use the so-called lead slowing down spectrometer. Uh, essentially here, the proton, it's a target. Uh, which is surrounded by a big uh, lead volume. So neutrons are produced in the spallation target, but then they uh, essentially go around uh, the um, lead, which uh, has a very small, um, uh, let's say, capture cross-section. So they uh, do a series of inelastic and elastic uh, reactions. In each interaction, uh, on, uh, neutron loses very little energy. So essentially, uh, neutrons are trapped in this uh, lead block. You see a simulation here. For one proton, you produce neutrons that fly around and they essentially are contained within this uh, block. So uh, you can, in this way, um, at any position inside uh, the lead slowing down, get a very high uh, neutron flux. Uh, of course, there is a problem here because this is, uh, the, the, you, can, you can still consider it a, a time of flight facility. You can still, let's say, obtain information on the uh, time of flight of neutron, but the energy resolution, the time energy relation is somehow uh, uh, lost, in, at least in, uh, let's say, in part of it is lost. So you, you have a, a low energy resolution, but you still can make, make uh, interesting measurements, which would otherwise be impossible to, ma to do at any other time of flight facilities for a uh, very uh, small amount of material, for example, for samples of very small uh, amount. Uh, uh, other facilities I mentioned before, uh, well, apart from the low energy uh, accelerators, there is J-PARC, which is uh, based on 3 GeV proton beam, uh, one megawatt power, and uh, in Russia there is uh, the Gneis um, in St. Petersburg. Now we go to the top facility. So this is uh, uh, in the line of time of flight facilities. Um, uh, this was uh, proposed in, uh, let's say, 15 years ago, 2000, at CERN, by a quite large collaboration for the field. Uh, it's about 100 researchers from uh, different institutes, mostly uh, European, but there is also a collaboration with Russia, India, uh, Japan, and so on. Now, uh, what typically the idea of uh, this new facility was to do uh, was to measure neutron-induced reactions, mm, 
neutron capture and neutron induced fission mostly, uh, both for nuclear astrophysics and this is, uh, will, you will see later on uh, uh, for isotopes typically between iron and lead, which are produced in stars by neutron capture reactions, also some light elements of interest for nuclear astrophysics. This is also the region where fission fragments, um, uh, the, 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 the region of fission fragments, so these uh, measurements here in this region of uh, isotopes are interesting also for uh, nuclear applications because, uh, again, the cross-section for fission fragments are important for transmutation projects. And of course, then there is the whole uh, activity on actinides, capture and fission cross-section on actinides for advanced nuclear reactors. Now, um, I will very quickly show the, uh, this probably will be shown, will be shown also by uh, my colleague later on. So how do we reconstruct the neutron time of flight? We have uh, uh, a proton beam hitting the spallation target. Neutrons are produced, then they fly in a tube. Uh, for a certain length, you will see what uh, it is now at the end of. And then when do it, they, uh, of course, uh, when they arrive on a sample, they produce a reaction. So the time difference between uh, the arrival of the proton beam and the reaction, the occurrence of the reaction, gives the time of flight. And from the time of flight, you can reconstruct the energy of the neutron, uh, of course, in, with the classical or relativistic formula. Now, at the end of, there are two beam lines. One is uh, 185 meters, so this is a very long and which uh, provides uh, measurements with high resolution. And then there is another one at 20 meters that has been constructed just last year, has been uh, entered in operation last year, and it's much closer, it's only 20 meters. So here the resolution is worse, but you have much higher flux. So you can make measurements that you cannot do in this other area. Now, uh, the facility at CERN is uh, essentially based on the 20 GeV protons from the proton synchrotron accelerator, which is, uh, this is the map of CERN. Uh, then uh, they go more or less in this, in this area where the spallation target, a lead spallation target is uh, placed. And then there is a tunnel uh, at CERN is like Swiss cheese. There are tunnels everywhere. So, and we did not have to make a new tunnel for Entoff. We used a pre-existing one. And uh, uh, inside that tunnel, uh, there is the uh, vacuum tube where neutrons fly for 185 meters. And here on top, now, there is another experimental facility. So, um, uh, this is uh, uh, one thing that I should mention, and is that 20 GeV protons on a lead block produce about 360 neutrons. Each proton produces about 360 neutrons. So you can imagine that you can produce a lot of flux. Now, this is a layout of the, uh, of the beam line. So you have several collimators, shielding walls, sweeping magnet we will see later. And then the experimental area is inside the same tunnel. And then, of course, neutrons fly uh, to die some later on, let's say, in a, I mean, uh, a so-called escape lane. Now, um, we, at the beginning, we, we, when the TOF was made, it was made very quickly, so we took some lead bricks, stacked them one on top of the other, put some water around for cooling and moderation, but that didn't work so well. So after three years, the um, lead blocks were a little bit, uh, sh let's say, displaced and uh, the beam had made, a, the proton beam had made a hole in the lead. So this had to be, of course, there was some release of radioactivity because of oxidation and so on. So we had, this had to be replaced in 2004. So we made a much more professional job uh, later on with uh, a, a, a monolithic cylind lead cylindrical block uh, surrounded by water. And uh, uh, this is what we are currently to use. This is, uh, let's say, the design. This is the container. The lead is inside here. And this is uh, the real thing that is now being inserted in the, uh, beam, in the proton beam line. So of course, to make a good proton, uh, neutron beam, you need uh, um, the spallation target, for sure. This is uh, quite a big block, uh, 80 by 80 by 40 centimeters square. Uh, this was the old one. Now it's about mm, 40 centimeter uh, mm, diameter by, uh, no, sorry, 80 centimeter diameter by 60 centimeter uh, uh, length. 
and then this is surrounded by water for cooling but also for moderation. Now we also have some different uh, material for moderation, borated water. And then we have uh, uh, the 200 meter, let's say, tunnel. Uh, but you need also a lot of shieldings for neutrons, gammas, muons, and so on. Uh, you need a magnet so to, to de deflect charged particles. And again, as I mentioned before, we need collimators. Now, here is a picture of the collimator. There are two kinds of collimators, one with a small aperture and one with big aperture for fission measurements. I will show later. This is, for example, an image of the sh uh, shielding iron wall for muons. And there are lots of muons in a reactor. So here I would like to show, to take you to a virtual tour of the facility. So we start with uh, um, the, that there is the spallation target, which is of course surrounded by uh, lots of shielding. And then this is the pre-existing tunnel with the uh, beam tube. And then we go to 70 meters with the first reduction of the neutron beam with, of course, some shielding around. Uh, then we fly some more, neutrons fly some more. Here is the first collimator that, that shapes the uh, neutron beam. Then there is a shielding wall with the chicane to go through. Uh, the magnet that sweeps the high energy par uh, particle, charge particles out of the beam. And then eventually uh, a second collimator here and uh, you will see now a wall that uh, defines the experimental area where the uh, devices, uh, the, uh, the detectors are. Uh, if you look at uh, a design, essentially uh, the neutron beam comes from here, the tunnel is a little bit uh, at the end, uh, curves a little bit. So the experimental area is essentially within the same tunnel. And this is a sort of a, let, let's say, a small problem, small or big problem at the end of, because we don't have much space, especially, uh, most importantly, neutrons uh, are bounced back and forth through the walls, and this increases typically the neutron background uh, uh, relative to other facilities. Uh, so this is the... Um, uh, a picture of the experimental area. This is the capture uh, calorimeter that probably we will see in the next measure in the next uh, talk. And this is the uh, neutron escape lane. Essentially, neutron go die in the floor uh, of the tunnel. Now, uh, what, what, is, what is so special about the Entop facility? Well, it all starts from the characteristics of the PS, the proton synchrotron proton beam. Uh, this is a uh, high energy proton beam, as I said, 20 GeV, uh, but it also has high peak current and uh, a low duty cycle. So each um, proton bunch um, is separated by, the, proton, the consecutive proton bunches are separated by more than one second, which is kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not, not so common in uh, time of flight facilities. And what you produce at the end in the uh, um, target plus moderation is a spectrum that has a very wide energy range. Uh, uh, all these neutrons are there at the same time, let's say, uh, from thermal to almost 1 GeV. Uh, you can have a flux, a neutron flux that looks like that with two peaks, one of thermal and one around 1 MeV, if you use normal water. But if you use as a moderator borated water, boron captures a lot of uh, thermal neutrons, so you suppress the thermal uh, peak, but uh, this is the advantage is also of suppressing the gammas that are produced by, uh, uh, in the water by hydrogen capture, and so you produce a different kind of uh, spectrum of the neutron flux. Now, the, the main features are the very high instantaneous neutron flux. So this is the main feature of the facility. You have uh, uh, essentially all the flux concentrated in, uh, uh, very in, in bunches, which are um, separated by uh, big time di distance. So you can have uh, 10 to the 6 neutrons in each pulse, and each pulse, again, after one second to, from each other. Uh, so this is very convenient, of course, for measuring radioactive isotopes. You, you can have all the events in a single bunch, uh, very short uh, amount of time, where, of course, you uh, have a small background. 
integrate a small background. And this is, of course, ideal for measuring branching point isotopes in case for, of astrophysics, or also for actinides, like that I uh, was mentioning before for nuclear technology. Other features are the high resolution in energy, because you have a long distance. And this allows you to study uh, quite accurately resonances in the cross-section. You have the wide energy range, as I mentioned before, all simultaneously, so all data at the same time uh, you get from uh, cross sections from thermal to GeV, uh, and the low repetition rate, uh, which is another important aspect w uh, uh, which much one should consider, which is the suppression of the so called wraparound. I will uh, come back to this problem in a second. Now, if, if you compare to other facilities, you see that NTOF is not, if, in fact, as in, in average, a, a flux which is smaller than uh, Lansk and Galena. But if you consider the instantaneous neutron flux, that is the amount of flux per bunch, uh, then NTOF is comparable to uh, Lansk uh, up to a certain energy, and it's much higher at higher energy. And of course, it's a little bit higher than, it's uh, quite a bit higher than uh, Galena. So um, this is a new facility that allows to measure radioactive isotopes. Uh, extend the resolved uh, resonance region to higher energy, and especially measure fission all the way to uh, several hundreds of MeV. And the second uh, uh, area will, uh, do, will make things even better in terms of flux, of course. Now, there has been a lot of measurements made in, uh, over the years, in these 15 years. I will uh, uh, not go through all of them, of course. I will just uh, uh, quickly, since uh, time is running out, I will quickly go through the experimental devices that are used for fission measurements. So first of all, let me say that, of course, when in a neutron facility, you need uh, uh, to monitor the neutron flux. So you need some detectors. In this case, for example, we use uh, detectors based on silicon, uh, uh, devices based on silicon detectors. You need capture detectors for measuring capture reactions. And fission detectors can be uh, of different, uh, we have used of different types like parallel plate avalanche counters, fission ionization chambers, and micromegas detectors. Now, the of course, the basic concept when measuring fission cross-sections is to, measure, to detect a fission fragment. There are two, two ways to do that, to measure only one fission fragment at the time, or you can do it, in, you can measure the two fission fragments in coincidence. And you will see that there is, of course, a clear advantage in measuring in coincidences. And you can, of course, use several uh, choice of detectors. But one important aspect is that when you measure the cross section, you have to do it relative to another, uh, to a reaction that, uh, whose cross section is well known. So you need to measure at the same time uh, one of the so called standards which is, for example, uranium-235 uh, in a certain energy region, uranium-238, uh, or there are also uh, other standards. This would be ideal, the um, elastic scattering on a proton, neutron elastic scattering on proton. That would be the ideal uh, measurement, but it's not so easy. Now, so at the end, what you really do is to measure the unknown sample, your actinite, for example, relative to uh, a, measure, the, a sample that uh, is already well known, whose cross section is already well known. And this is uh, uh, typically a, ra a ratio, this is called a ratio measurement. And this is very important because it minimizes systematic uncertainties related to the uh, technique, to the experimental technique. And in principle, you can do a good job down to a few percent. If all the systematic uncertainties, you remember, uh, as I mentioned before, that is very important to keep all the systematic uh, errors under control. Now, um, I will go quickly about this uh, cross section. So this is a table of the uh, um, range, energy range in which the reactions uh, that I mentioned before are considered standard. Standard means that the cross section is very well known, is accepted by the, uh, the, let's say, the community as a reference. So for example, the lithium uh, six um, NT uh, reaction is considered standard from thermal energy, 25 milli electron volts to one MeV. Uh, uranium-235, which is the one that we usually use as reference, is standard at thermal energy. And then from uh, 100, uh, sorry, this, there is a mistake here. Uh, from 0, uh, 0,15 MeV 
to 200 MeV. So from 150 keV to 200 MeV. And uh, uranium-238 from 2 MeV to 200 MeV. So uh, typically uranium-235 and plutonium-239 uh, are used as reference, are used as, uh, uh, let's say, standard of measurements. And this uh, as, uh, uh, eliminates the needs of many corrections and minimizes systematic uncertainty. Now, uh, you know how efficient chamber works. Uh, so you have uh, essentially uh, two electrodes, um, parallel electrodes with some gas in between. Uh, neutron, you have a sample which is attached to one of the electrodes. A sample is the fissile material that you want to measure, the, the material that you want to measure the fission cross section. So you have a neutron impinging on this sample, produces uh, fission fragments, or the sample can produce uh, alphas by the alpha decay. So uh, they release some energy, and um, uh, this is, the, let's say, the simplest uh, kind of device, but it's also one of the most powerful. Of course, in this case, you detect only one fragment at a time, because the other one, which is emitted uh, uh, opposite to this one, is, of course, absorbed in the backing, is absorbed in the electrode, and there is nothing else uh, to detect here. So uh, this is uh, one fragment uh, detection. And, uh, but you can still do a very good job. For example, this is uh, um, the spectrum, the amplitude spectrum for uranium-235. You see the alphas are typically very low amplitude. And then you have uh, the fission fragments. Sometimes you don't see, the, you should see two peaks, but sometimes you don't, either because the resolution of the detector is not so good or because the fission fragments uh, don't release all their energy in the gas. So, uh, but you can st e click, easily identify fission fragments, discriminate them from alpha particles. Uh, when you, things become a little bit more complicated when you go to a sample that has a very large uh, radioactivity, uh, alpha decay. Uh, in this case, this alpha peak becomes huge. It goes out of scale. And you can have pile up of alpha particles or pile up between alpha and fission fragments. And this complicates the, the picture, so you need to put higher threshold, you lose efficiency, uh, you may also do, uh, start getting problems of not controlling the systematic uh, uh, error related, for example, to the efficiency itself or to the pile up, to the contamination of uh, pile ups. Uh, now, um, over the years, there have been, we have used several uh, systems, certain TOF. Uh, one the, in, at the beginning, we used a fission ionization chamber that was, in fact, uh, produced by uh, our colleagues from, uh, was built by, by our colleagues in uh, Obninsk in uh, uh, collaboration with CERN. Uh, more recently, we are using micro, micro megas detectors. I will give brief, uh, just a few more details on this uh, chamber, uh, which is a little more convenient. And as I mentioned before, we are used also parallel plate avalanche counters uh, for measuring fragments in coincidence. Now, this is very interesting because, and it's very nice because it, when you detect the two fission fragments in coincidence, you can reject much easier uh, the uh, alpha particles, of course, because so uh, alpha particles don't, don't make coincidence. Uh, so you have a very good rejection of the alpha background. Uh, you also have very low material around, so you have a very low sensitivity to uh, gamma rays, let's say, or gamma, the gamma flash, which is typical of the spallation. And you have um, also the possibility to reconstruct the angular distribution of this fission fragment because some of these electrodes are position sensitive. So you get give you the position of the fission fragments. Uh, this is a photo of the uh, parallel plate. There is a stack of devices, and in between there are samples uh, that we measure. Uh, uh, the recently, there is also uh, been a um, uh, different configuration, which the, the detectors are tilted relative to the neutron beam by 45 degrees typically, and this allows you to cover more uh, completely the angular, to, to have a more complete coverage of the angular distribution. Okay, I will not go too much in detail. This is now uh, the um, tilted uh, configuration. Uh, well, okay, 
not much time to go through these details. OK, just a few words about the micromegas detector. This is the difference relative to the ionization chamber in this kind of detector is that there is some internal amplification of the uh, essentially electrons that are produced uh, in the gas. So this um, allows to um, have a better uh, signal to background ratio, at, at least relative to the electronic noise. Uh, but also, it, by tuning the gain, you can uh, essentially um, uh, discriminate better the alpha particles as well. Uh, and this I've already mentioned. So one final feature is that in uh, Atentov, we, uh, we don't use very complicated electronics for our processing. We just take the signals coming from the device, the detectors with some preamplification or amplification, and we put them in a flash ADC. A flash ADC is essentially an oscilloscope where you uh, record the shape of the signal, and then offline, you reconstruct it, and you extract all the information you, you like, like the timing, the energy, and so on. Now, um, I uh, so this is a typically, for example, a, a, a neutron pulse. So you see the gamma flash, which tells you that there is essentially a reference, a time reference. This is related to the arrival of the protons on the spallation target. And then you have uh, signals related to fission fragments. This is uh, a zoom of the signal. So then from the timing relative to the gamma flash, you get uh, the, from the time of flight and you can reconstruct the neutron energy. And of course, from the amplitude, you can uh, see if it is a fission fragment or an alpha particle and so on. Uh, in data analysis, one of the important features, one of the important things you have to first do is a good time to energy calibration. And this is uh, particularly complicated in a spallation uh, facility because during the spallation process, neutrons uh, lose some time. So uh, they, um, essentially, when they come out, they, they come with already uh, a certain time delay, which depends on the moderation that they have. Uh, undergone. So you need somehow to correct for this effect, and you do this through simulations. Uh, and on top of that, you need to also estimate exactly what is the uh, uh, flight path length. And you can do that with some, uh, uh, let's say, resonances, well-known resonances in energy. So this gives you, give you some calibration points. One thing that is extremely important to consider is that when you go to high energy, you have to consider also the resolution function, the so-called resolution function of the neutron beam. That is, uh, for a given time of flight, neutrons that arrive at a given time of flight have a, a, an energy distribution, an energy spectrum. And uh, so uh, this makes the rest, for example, if you take a resonance of iron, this is a captured resonance of iron, it naturally should look like this. But when uh, you measure it, it is uh, broadened, by the resolution function of your device, of your uh, beam, sorry, uh, and as well as by the Doppler effect. So you have to take this into account as well when you analyze the data in order to, uh, do, to be very accurate in energy and in uh, uh, resonance strength. And then there is, of course, a problem of uh, pile-up, signal pile-up that you need to reconstruct and, uh, 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 let's say, separate possibly, or if you cannot separate, you need to take into account the dead time, intrinsic dead time related to the technique. Uh, so some correction is needed. Okay, um, maybe I should go much faster now because uh, there is, uh, of course, the problem of dead time is one of the main problems in the data analysis. You have some events which are lost. You need to correct for those events with a certain assumption, with a certain formula. Now, typically, in the old acquisition systems, this, this time, this dead time was of the order of microseconds. Now, if you record all pulses, one after the other, you can reduce this to tens of nanoseconds. And this, of course, makes the correction also much smaller and so more accurate uh, the, the cross-sections that you can uh, uh, detect. Now, I mentioned before, this is an important point, I mentioned before that one of the sources of background in fission cross-section or in, uh, in general in cross-section measurements in uh, uh, um, neutron facilities, neutron time of flight facilities, it is, is the so-called wraparound 
problem. So uh, you, here is, for example, the arrival of a proton beam on target. And then you produce a neutron bunch. This contains neutrons of all energies, of course. Now, the lowest, the lowest energy neutrons will arrive quite late, may overlap with the fastest neutrons from a, uh, from a con uh, following uh, proton bunch. So they will uh, um, appear as a background and will produce some events uh, uh, which are not, of course, real, they were uh, in this bunch. They are not related to this bunch, but they are related to the previous one. So this has to be corrected, and mm, there are several techniques. One can use filters to kill low-energy neutrons, or um, another possibility is to uh, determine the background by using uh, threshold isotopes, like uranium-238, which does not have uh, low energy uh, events, uh, energy, uh, events at low energy, low neutron energy. But uh, at the top, for example, this um, uh, effect is not present because the distance between the bunches is much longer than the neutron bunch itself. The neutron bunch, it lasts 100 milliseconds, and the distance between two consecutive pulses is one second. So you have 10 times bigger distance between pulses than the, the duration of the neutron bunch itself. And now uh, let's go a little bit more in detail in the measurement of the uh, cross-section. So uh, typically the cross-section is done, you measure some count rates, you subtract some background, divide by the flux, the number of atoms per bunch of your sample, correct for the efficiency, and also other correction factors for the time or anisotropy or anything you can think of. Now, uh, the idea is that if you measure the count, the, the something for uh, a, a, your sample, but and you also at the same time measure uranium-235, and you make the ratio uh, between the two, what happens is that in the ratio, the fluxes cancel out. So you take the ratio of the count rates, which is measured, the count rate for your uh, sample, the count rate for your reference sample, and then you correct for the uh, some calculated quantities, many systematic effects cancel out. In particular, you don't need to know accurately your flux, which is always very difficult to measure. And you also, in the, uh, ra the ratio of the efficiency is uh, uh, typically much better than knowing the efficiency itself. Uh, so the systematic effects are canceled out mostly in uh, the ratio method. So the measured quantity is the ratio of count rates between your sample, the new sample that you want to measure, and the reference sample. And then you multiply by a, a calculated quantity. And uh, this, of course, gives you uh, uh, directly the cross-section of the unknown sample. You simply multiply the cross-section of the reference sample, which is well known, by this ratio that you have determined in this way and uh, you get the cross-section. So this is uh, typically what um, we do uh, at Entoff, but also at other facilities, to measure fission cross-sections. And as I mentioned before, it's very important to have this reference, this uh, uh, uranium-235 or plutonium-239, uh, which is considered standard uh, with cross-sections that are typically known within uh, 1%. Now, uh, well, OK. Uh, there's not much time to go. One thing that I should mention is that uh, uranium-235 is standard only at uh, thermal and between 0 0.15 and 200 MeV. So what happens in between? Well, in between, you have to rely on different standards. For example, lithium, uh, lithium and alpha reaction. Uh, in order to get a smooth, uh, let's say, neutron flux, uh, and the reason is that in between there are lots of resonances, and in the valley of the resonances, uh, the cross sections may not be very accurate. Uh, so you cannot get very, uh, let's say, this ratio me method will not properly work in a region which is, let's say, intermediate between thermal and 150 keV. So you need a different method there. Um, okay. So, uh, so lots of uh, background okay, in 
the measurements that you need to be taken into account, electronic noise. The most important one is certainly the alpha particles from radioactive decay of the sample. You can have spontaneous fission. Uh, and of course, you can have neutrons scattered by the detectors, which are thermalized in the experimental area and come back to your sample. Uh, you have uh, wraparound neutrons that I mentioned before. And you have to take into account also the resolution function. Uh, but the best, uh, you can al always calculate all these backgrounds and subtract them, but the best is always to try to minimize as much as possible these sources of background. And you do that uh, by increasing the neutron flux, uh, which I guess uh, minimizes the ambient background or the uh, effect of the natural radioactivity, or minimize the mass of the detector and the surrounding material. Uh, OK, the uncertainty, I will, I will just briefly, and then I will stop. Um, so the we have measured several reactions at Dentoff. Uh, all the way from thorium to curium to, to 45. Um, we have measured uh, also some um, fission fragment anisotropy, angular anisotropy. Uh, we plan to measure some more uh, isotopes now that we have a, a second experimental area with uh, much higher neutron flux. And this, of course, will be the short-lived isotopes like uh, plutonium-238, which, which has only 87 years, or even worse, the plutonium-241, which has 14 years of uh, uh, lifetime. Uh, I will, uh, don't have time to, to go too much to many of these details, Some, a few, just a few examples. Look, for example, at the uranium-236, if I may use only five more minutes, five or ten more minutes. Uh, so. If you looked at the uh, libraries for uranium-236 cross-section, you see that uh, the Japanese library had only one resonance and the cross-section was typically very low, while the European and the American cross-section had lots of resonances and the cross-section was very high. Can now look at the characteristics of the sample. You have, uh, okay, some mass and so on, but you also have some contamination of uranium-235. Now, in our case, uh, it was very small contamination. Can you guess uh, why there are so many resonances in uh, these libraries? Maybe I can help you. The, they are based, can, does anybody have a guess? They were based on a measurement in which the contamination of uranium-235 was higher and that had not been subtracted. So all these resonances were coming from uranium-235, not from uranium-236. So we measured again with a very low uh, contamination, and we found out that uh, the cross-section was, in fact, uh, what uh, Jandel predicted, very low and with only few resonances. And this is one of the measurements the, uh, the measurement of Entoff, the, the, the symbols, relative to the NDF cross-section, which is, was two orders of magnitude higher. So this, we have to be careful. Uh, okay, this is at high energy. So you have to be careful. Uh, one of the most important features in the measurement is the sample. Purity, very accurate mass, uh, very accurate homogeneity, and so on. If you have contaminations, uh, you have to take them into account, otherwise you're lost. I will forget about neptunium. Uh, see, this is another case in which contamination is very important. This is americium-241 that we measured uh, at Entoff. And uh, in this case as well, there were discrepancies between libraries, and we found out that um, even our, our sample contained a very tiny amount of plutonium-239 and americium-242 metastable. But their cross-section is much, much bigger than the americium itself, the americium-241. So you can see that it, it influences the results. So you need to um, uh, subtract it in order to estimate correctly the, uh, uh, um, the cross-section. Okay, and this is uh, just a few results I don't have time to show, but you can see here that the Entoff results confirm some libraries while some previous uh, libraries were completely wrong. Uh, again, the American 243, uh, there were only two measurements. One of them was made with, uh, I think, one uh, uh, lead slowing down spectrometer, so very low resolution. But uh, again, in this case, we had, there, are, were, there were lots of contaminations from nasty uh, isotopes that had to be taken into account. Once you do that, you, you'd find out the reason why there was a discrepancy between libraries uh, or measurements before. And a very interesting case is the curium-245. 
Um, so this is very, an extremely difficult measurement. The Coulomb 245 is uh, a relatively long half-life, 8,000 years. But there is a contamination of Coulomb 244, 6.6%, which is a much shorter half-life, half -life, and uh, produces a lot of alpha uh, decay. And not only that, but it produces also some spontaneous fission. So this is a very complicated measurement. Uh, and this is why there were only few data, for example, our thermal energy, with differences of uh, 30, 50 percent. Uh, now, uh, we, of course, in this case, for example, even at Tentov, we were not able to get a very accurate estimate of the efficiency of our detector, because we had to put a high threshold to kill all the alpha background. But we, we, the only thing we could do is to normalize our data to some uh, previous uh, measurement made at thermal energy. Fortunately, there were new measurements made at ILL, which is uh, in Grenoble, close by here, and at Mall, uh, even closer. Uh, they, so we normalized the data, uh, our data, to these reactor uh, measurements. And uh, what we saw that uh, there were only two measurements made in the 70s, I think both of them at Los Alamos, at low energy, and they were completely different from each other. Uh, you can barely see white is white, brown is green. Well, sorry for the, mis the colors. But anyway, NTOF is the black. And you can see libraries, the data were completely different. Now we have a better handle, we have a better knowledge. Then what we, what we found out about this measurement was another interesting feature. At higher energy, above 30 electron volt, there was only one measurement. And this one measurement was made with a nuclear explosion, the neutron beam of a nuclear explosion. So it would be nice if somebody would volunteer. I could pass maybe the paper, and somebody could give a seminar on how to make a fission cross-section measurement with a nuclear explosion. If there is a volunteer, uh, then he can give a... Uh, a report on that later on during the week. Anyway, we found out that we agreed perfectly. The new res the measurement at Entoff agreed perfectly with the uh, old measurement made with the nuclear explosion. So what we concluded was that uh, uh, essentially Entoff can provide similar results as a nuclear explosion, but with fewer side effects, let's say. And anyway, now it's not possible. Now there are many other um, uh, things that we could discuss about. For example, there are problems, uh, we, th we think there are problems in, even in the uranium-235 cross-section uh, between 10 and 30 keV. Uh, we are planning to measure that more accurately in the future. One important uh, recent measurement was, uh, a recent uh, paper, let's say, was the measurement of the ratio between uranium-238 and uranium-235 fission cross-section all the way to 1 GeV. These are for the first, there were, there was a problem here because there were only two measurements, uh, one from Lisowski and the other one from Sherbakov, and they disagreed by almost 10%. Uh, so we measured um, uh, more very accurately with different detectors, all the detectors we had in, in particular, and we found out that Lisowski and current evaluations are correct. On top of that, we extended the uh, knowledge of the fission cross-section all the way to 1 GeV, and you can see that some libraries, this is typically the ratio between the cross-section measured at Entoff and a library, and you see the European library is pretty bad. The Japanese is not so bad. ENDF, which is the American, is very good. And of course, at, they all stop at 200. No, this, this is an extension above 200 MeV, but it's not so nice. And we also have another model for, for uh, uh, estimating the cross-section, and that gives good results up to 1 GeV. So I will stop here because they essentially, well, okay, there are some more details on the angular distribution, but there is no time. I will just say that we have a second experimental area. This, in this case, the neutron beam is vertical. It comes from uh, below. This is the experimental area. With, uh, these are the uh, service rooms, let's say. Uh, this is the building. Uh, the first beam um, uh, arrived last year in uh, uh, more or less July 2014. Uh, this is, uh, these are some devices that were mounted for measuring the neutron flux. Uh, we also did the first measurement of fission cross-section in this second experimental area. This is a micro chamber that I was mentioning before. 
Um, now, the a big advantage of the second experimental area, you see it here, is the flux, which is more than 30 times bigger. On top of that, you also have a shorter uh, time of flight, so you have a shorter um, duration of the neutron bunch. So the signal to background ratio improves by two orders of magnitudes at most. And you can see the nice result here. Uh, this is the plutonium-240 fission cross fission, uh, let's say, um, uh, measure the measurement of the fission cross section made in the first experimental area is essentially dominated by the alpha background, alpha pile up and so on. These are the fission fragments. If you go to the second experimental area, now the alpha background is much more suppressed relative to the uh, fission fragments, so it is becomes now much easier to set a threshold and determine the fission cross section. And in fact, there will be a poster on this reaction. Uh, which is one the, the first time it was measured with this uh, um, uh, accuracy. Uh, so I suggest you to look at this poster by uh, Thanos Tomatopoulos. Uh, this is the picture of the experimental detail. So they w this is uh, we are planning to measure more short-lived actinides in this second experimental area. I, w I don't have much time to talk about the surrogate method, but essentially this is a method that allows indirectly to determine the cross-section using uh, not a neutron beam, but a charged particle beam, which produces the same uh, compound nucleus. And then with some uh, uh, calculations, mm, other calculations, you can uh, go from this indirect measurement to the direct, to the, uh, direct uh, neutron induced cross-section measurement. There are several examples. I don't have time to go, but this is a promising uh, and interesting method. Not always, uh, uh, of course, can be applied. You need to find the specific reaction that produces the same compound nucleus. But OK, uh, sorry, I had to go a little bit faster because it was only one hour. So uh, the conclusion is that, of course, there is a strong need for accurate new data, in particular on uh, fission, for advanced nuclear technology. And there is a large effort in, uh, in the international community in terms of improving the uh, neutron beams. Uh, the facility, neutron facilities, also the detection uh, systems, the, the, the techniques, and so on. Uh, within this effort, uh, we can inscribe also the ENTOF facility that was built in 2001 at uh, CERN, and uh, uh, where la several long-lived actinides uh, have been measured, both in terms of fission and capture cross-section. Uh, now we have also a second experimental area with the higher flux, so this will allow us probably, uh, most probably, to measure also some short-lived actinides. So I will stop here. Sorry for... Thank you.